Thomas Piketty can hardly be accused of rushing to conclusions in his new book. But the French academic is a rock star public intellectual who chronicles centuries of economic history. So why rush? Piketty's influence is considerable. His last book sold more than two and a half million copies. And people will certainly be scanning the new one in search of political inspiration. Many a career has been made describing society's ills or exploring the history of politics, economics or class. But Piketty occupies a more provocative perch. In his huge books, Capital in the 21st Century and now Capital and Ideology, he explores not just how societies have developed, but also what might be done to tackle inequality. Piketty argues that ever since the Reagan-Thatcher revolutions of the early 80s, the normal rules of class politics have ceased to apply, with the lower paid pulling away from the old left and the right mobilising nativist sentiment. The answer to this challenge, he believes, lies in a comprehensive system of wealth redistribution with a tax triptych, inheritance, wealth and income, to re-engineer society. The monies raised would go on making access to education more equal and giving those without wealth an endowment of €120,000 on their 25th birthday. That could be used to buy a flat, start a business or indeed blow on travelling the world. Piketty believes that such radical redistribution has to be coordinated internationally. He wants the European Union to agree common taxation and spending arrangements so big companies don't play its member states off against each other. His ambitions ultimately are global. That's what's needed, he argues, to stop the tech giants gaming the system. Well, earlier we met up with Thomas Piketty and asked him whether the Labour Party's fate in the last UK election might not suggest that he'd overestimated the public appetite for a socialist policy of redistribution. Well, he, he had pretty much the same platform in 2017 and he, and he, and he got one of the highest uh, uh, you know, share of the popular vote that the Labour Party has obtained over, over the past three or four decades and he was very close to the Conservative Party. So I think the real difference is in 2019 is that the election was entirely about Brexit. Brexit illustrates a problem not only for Britain or the Labour Party in Britain but a problem for, for the whole of Europe that the European Union uh, has been perceived more and more by the middle class and the, and the lower socio-economic groups as uh, working mostly uh, to the benefit of the uh, most mobile uh, high human capital, high financial capital group and so So then you, you, have, you have two different responses. There's one response which is a bit what we've had with Donald Trump and Boris Johnson and the Brexiters which is we're going to control the movement of people, we're going to restrict migration we are going to control the circulation of people, build a wall uh, between the uh, US and Mexico, or build a wall between Britain and Europe. I s don't think this is really going to work. I think we need to control capital uh, rather than control people. Oh, and, and, and that's where, you know, the European Union and globalization more generally has to, has to change. And you have a very ambitious platform about harmonization of tax and uh, and an awful lot of rules to stop people flowing money from one country to another to avoid uh, redistribution and mm. that kind of thing. But do you think any uh, country among the 27 in the EU would actually support such a platform now? I mean, well, it's a big ask, isn't it, yeah, to, well, to integrate uh, that to that degree the entire fiscal uh, structure of the European Union? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's better than to have uh, Brexit after Brexit and, you know, it's, uh, so at some point... You and know, that's you, what you, you think will happen? I think there's a risk, yes. I think there's a risk that, uh, you know, the, you have this discontent, you know, this popular discontent about the European Union is not going to go away like this. So you have to do something. The question is, again, do you want to uh, 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 control the movement of people, put restriction on the circulation of labour, which has been the the Brexit way or the Trumpist uh, approach, or do you want to better control the movement of capital and how much uh, investors uh, you know, are able to avoid taxation? You um, characterize these uh, limitations on the movement of people as Trumpist uh, and a reaction in that sense, but we have a candidate for the Labour Party leadership who also wants to end freedom of movement. 
And you have some other parties like the Social Democrats in Denmark who've been very tough on immigration because they see that as a way of regaining relevance and electoral appeal. You're saying that's the wrong way for a left of centre party well, to go. You well, know, of course, you know, it's easier to be tough uh, with migrants than to be tough with Google or to be tough with millionaires. But, you know, at some point uh, you have to decide what, what you want to stand for. You know, I think an economic system where uh, billionaires or Google, you know, pay less tax than small and medium sized companies or less tax than the middle class. It's a system that's just not uh, uh, sustainable in the long run because this is bringing down, you know, just the, the basic legitimacy and the basic social contract on which our societies are built requires some minimal level of, of uh, economic uh, uh, justice. You've got one other, well, you've got many ambitious ideas, but one other one that really is eye-catching to us, which is this idea of an endowment that 25-year-olds might get some... Uh, sum of capital, maybe 120,000 euros uh, to begin their life. Mm. Really? I mean, do you think a 25-year-old isn't going to spend it all on, on travel to Thailand and beer and... And you are not concerned that some rich kids get uh, a million euro or 10 million euro? So do you want to restrict their right to, to use this money? Because, you know, I think... what, what well, I'm, I'm sure they waste it, but... Uh, uh, yeah, but, but then what do you propose to do about this? Are you happy with this? So, I, you know, I think uh, we, we have to care about the freedom, not only of rich kids, but the freedoms of, you know, the kids of the middle class and the, and the lower socioeconomic groups. So, I, I, you know, I think this is quite moderate and this is very important if you want to equalize opportunities in societies and you want to allow all children, you know, to gain some independence, to be able to create a company, to be able also to be in a better bargaining position Last question. Um, it, it is a hugely ambitious blueprint and it's a very uh, joined up vision of uh, how to achieve a more just world. How long would it take? If the political forces yes. in the world started to flow your way and well, things really started to, to look very promising, how long do you think it would take to execute this vision of social justice? Oh, this can go very fast. In, in every time period, you have uh, uh, dominant groups who pretend that nothing can change and that, you know, inequality is natural and, and, and that nothing can ever be transformed. But the big lesson of history is that things always uh, change uh, more quickly than what people imagine, for good or worse. Because, you know, although there's a process of learning about justice and a long-term process of reduction of inequality in human society, which I document in this book, you can also have setback. And, uh, you know, I think the movement toward nativism that we observe today in a number of countries, including in the US and to some extent in Britain, uh, you know, is, uh, is unfortunately one possible setback, which will not last forever. Don Spickety, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, TV presenter Philip Schofield today announced that he's gay.